Good morning. The tradition of reciting poetry was very common in my childhood home. I think I was about eight years old when my mother taught me to recite James Weldon Johnson's epic poem, The Creation. And from then until I left home, every year or every time something would happen, I was trotted out and asked to recite this poem at church functions. And I, I still know most of the words to that poem to this day. It was my mother's favorite. And I remember even at the end of her life when she was in a nursing home, Demesha robbed her of a lot of her memories, but she could still dramatically recite these poems of the African-American greats that she loved so much. And the creation was still her favorite. Every time somebody came to visit, she would recite that poem in dramatic fashion. And if James Weldon Johnson's name sounds familiar to you, you probably hear it every February because his poem, Lift Every Voice, was later adopted and set to music as the Negro National Anthem. So my son's middle name is Langston. So that should give you a little clue about who my favorite poem is, poet is. I think more than any other writer, Langston Hughes recorded the nuances and the frustrations of being black in America. In his own words, he said he wrote for the common man. He wrote for roustabouts and job seekers and people who are up today and down tomorrow. And I also think that one of the ways to judge the significance of an artist's work, especially written work, is to see how it holds up over time. And over the past four years, I've really been reminded of how significant Hughes's work is in America. Because every time I saw one of those red hats with the four letters across them, it reminded me of Hughes' poem because it talks about the despair but it also talks about hope. And it's a long poem. And if you haven't read it, I hope the excerpt that I'm about to read to you will give you the urge to go and look it up for yourself. But it says in part, America was never America to me. The free, who said free, not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today, the millions shot down when we strike, the millions who have nothing for our pay, for all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dreams that's almost dead today. Oh yes, I say it plain. America was never America to me. And yet, I swear this oath, America yet will be. So as a, a lover of poetry, I was really excited when I heard that Amanda Gorman would make history as the nation's youngest poet laureate. I was already very familiar with her work and I knew whatever she would do on that day would be very powerful. And did she ever deliver? I don't know about you, but when she implored us to move to what shall be, a country that is bruised but hold, benevolent but bold, fierce and free, I felt those words in my core. I felt an urgency to do something, an urgency to make a bigger contribution. And this is what American, African-American poets especially have done over the past 250 years. 
They have looked at life as we've lived it and given us words and works about beauty and injustice, about music and muses, about Africa and America, about freedoms and foodways and Harlem and history and funk and opera, boredom and longing and jazz and joy. These bards have used this great art form to record our turbulent history and they've created a multifaceted tradition that is both a reckoning with American realities and an imaginative response to them. I think Amanda is our sign that this beautiful tradition is in good hands. African-American poets have always been our voice to help us express ideas like words matter, labels matter. And there's no better example than County Cullen's short poem, The Incident. Once writing in old Baltimore, heart filled, head filled with glee, I saw a Baltimorean keep looking straight at me. Now I was eight and very small, and he was no whit bigger. And so I smiled, but he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December of all the things that happened there. That's all that I remember. So again, these past four years, we have to remember our words matter. So whether we need to celebrate or commiserate, African-American poets have given voice to our emotions and left an, ind an indelible stamp on American culture, on American literature, on American history, and on our, our psyche. If you want further proof, just look at the curriculum of every school you, you've ever been in. The curriculum always includes the poetry of Phyllis Wheatley. I did a Google search the other day and at least seven Paul Lawrence Dunbar schools came up. If you don't know, Dunbar was the son of former slaves and he wrote the poem, We Wear the Mask in 1896. But even today, that poem resonates as an apt description of oppression, racism, and identity. Again, our culture is so full of African-American poetry and poets. Who can forget Maya Angelou's delivery of her poem on the pulse of mourning at the Clinton inauguration? Or her poem, Phenomenal Woman, who has become an anthem for women who are defying traditional standards of beauty in today's media. The lives and works of poets like Gwendolyn Brooks, Amira Baraki, Rita Dove, James Baldwin, Audre Lorde, Claude McKay, Nikki Giovanni, and two recent favorites whose works have won Pulitzer Prizes, Natasha Trethway and Tahimba Jess, all serve as to inspire and to pave the way for Amanda Gorman. So now the world will know the new day blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If we are only brave enough to see it, if we are only brave enough to be it. And I hope you will go and look for the works of African-American poets and celebrate the indelible stamp that they've had on our culture and celebrate their voices. Thank you.